I live in a small town in northeastern Pennsylvania. It's surrounded by farms and endless forests. As a kid, I spent most of my time fishing for trout or building stick forts. Now, I have bonfires and deer hunt. So, as you can imagine, I'm outside most of the time. At this point, I know almost every paw print or call of the local animals, and I can identify it almost immediately. At the age of 13, I went over to hang one of my friend's houses for his birthday party, mid-June, alongside another two guys. We used to hang on a lot, but after this incident happened, we broke apart and all went our own ways. Anyway, we were crazy and imagining exploring abandoned places, finding paranormal spirits, as all the YouTubers did at the time. About three miles into the forest, there was this abandoned quarry. All of us were excited to explore it, so we got the birthday boy, his name is Aiden, to lie to his dad and say we were going for a walk through the woods. Aiden's dad said yes, but to not wander off too far and to pay attention to the trees, due to the sheer number of mountain lion sightings in the area very recently. Many say they don't live here in Pennsylvania, said to be a boogeyman of sorts, but I've seen one with my own eyes. I can tell you for a fact, they're here, along with wolves. We geared up, all grabbing our phone and knives. Well, at the time, I didn't have a knife, but I borrowed one from the bigger guys. His name was Clayton, and he's a little out of shape, to put it nicely. He usually brought around ten knives to our parties, like some kind of deranged serial killer. Sometimes he made me worry. He also gave one to our fourth guy, named Marcus. More ghetto than country, but it's okay. We got along at the time. As we packed our bags and got ready, we poked fun at each other, me insulting Aiden's choice of footwear, wearing a pair of black and white vans, while the rest of us wore boots. Clayton poking fun at me for being the smallest guy in the group, and Marcus backing up Clayton's insults. As we headed out the door, excited for what we were going to find in the amazing abandoned quarry, Imagining old mine shafts deep in the ground where coal was mined, or copper. The air seemed to change, and change as is heavier, like when a kid in class threatens to kill everybody in the room. Yeah, that kind of heavy. Almost a primitive fear. As I eerily looked around, curious about what installed this primitive fear into my system. The others talked about what we were going to find. I think we're going to find some coal. Maybe we can sell it to a local farmer, said Clayton, in an almost wishful sort of way. It's a quarry, not a mine shaft, yelled Aiden, furious with such a ridiculous comment. Aiden had a tendency to get angry over silly mistakes. Even a misspoken word was enough to set him off. Same thing, mineshaft quarry. All things worth exploring. Shut up, before I knock you out, Aiden yelled in rage, almost about to throw a fist and knock his teeth. As Marcus calmed both of them down, I zoned out. As we were walking into the woods now, after going through along a field, the feeling of dread was getting stronger, and I almost wanted to run. I knew I was being watched. I always know. When someone stares at me in class, I usually look directly at them when I notice the feeling. I started to scan my surroundings. Maple trees, rocks, cliffs, bones, birds, beehives. Wait, bones? I backtracked to where I seen bones and looked a little closer. About 60 yards away, at the bottom of a cliff was a dead deer. Fresh. Blood still on its bones. Flesh hanging from its skull. 
I imagined a thing that could have mutilated it so badly, and immediately thought of a thousand pound black bear with rabies, going rabid and crazy. Honestly, I wish it was just a bear. Hey, I'm talking to you. Clayton pegged me with a rock, breaking my trance. What? What do you want, man? I asked him clearly annoyed. He asked me what I was looking at, irritated that I did not respond. I told him nothing, and let's get going. We still have another two and a half miles till we even reach the quarry. Nothing exciting happened as we climbed a large hill. I felt the air get heavier, and my primal fear clawing its way up my spine, as if about it to dig itself out. Once we reached the top of the hill, there was a level part, still filled with maple and birch trees and some decent-sized rocks. There was barbed wire fencing that led to a clearing, freshly mowed like a field. Aiden commented, saying that was his property, and his neighbor probably was trespassing again. As we got to the fence, I noticed something. Something red hanging from a fence. A rag, or a piece of clothing, covered in dried blood. Underneath it was a rusted old knife, with a saw blade on one side and a sharp edge on the other. Me and Marcus argued for a minute about who got the knife, and I gave in, let him have it. We crawled under the fence and walked through the field. Right now, we were only about a half mile away from the quarry. I zoned out again as we walked. No one was talking about anything exciting anyway. I scanned my surroundings when my fear jumped, almost right out of me. I couldn't place it as I frantically looked around. Something bad, something evil was nearby. I could feel it. I could sense it in my spirit. I was at the back of the line, so nobody noticed my panic. I was scanning tree to tree, looking for something out of place. And when I got to a birch tree, roughly 25 yards away, I saw it. There was a large, lengthy gray hand wrapped around the tree. I could almost just about make out claws. Then I looked up a little bit above the hand, and I could just barely see the edge of a head. I looked at my friends, who got a little bit ahead of me, looked back at the tree, and the gray thing was gone. I ran to catch up with my friends, deciding to keep what I just saw quiet, so I'm not made fun of for the rest of the weekend. We finally started to see a clearing up ahead, with another barbed wire fence. We walked through a patch of thorn bushes, about as tall as me. It shredded our bare torsos as we took off our shirts and hung them from our shoulders. We crouched under the fence and finally made it to the quarry. And now, almost 50 years later, it was just some old cow pasture. We were a little bummed out as we're hoping for the ultimate mine shaft experience, but we knew logically what we would find. There was this cool little part, though, where the rock was cut out, leaving a ten-foot drop below to the cow pasture. We went over there, screwed around on the cliff. It was roughly 100 yards away from the tree line, so we were a little far from the woods. There was a pallet with some perfectly cut out square rocks in it. We looked through them, fascinated by how precise they were. But in the end, we just left them. Aiden got the idea to take some Instagram pictures, and we got in a pose to take photos for all of our pages. Aiden. We all spun around, towards the woods, hearing Aiden's dad. But it was off, almost mechanical sounding, startled by how quiet it was, like a loud whisper. But the woods were 100 yards away. My fear crawled its way into me, and I wanted to go home, knowing something was very, very wrong. Guys, we need to go, I stated. Walking towards the tree line, the others followed. My fear grew stronger and stronger. I scanned the field, then the cliff, then the trees. 
As I was walking, we were at the tree line, scrambling under the fence. Snap. A branch cracked not far from us. We all look. Marcus still under the fence. And we saw it. Twenty yards away was this nine-foot human-like animal. Not even an animal. I mean, it stood on two legs like a human. But its gray skinny arms ended at its knees. And its claws were as big as its hands. It was partially crouched, perching its elbows on its knees, staring at us with hot, hot red eyes. Teeth sticking out of its mouth like a piranha, with large canines like a wolf. Its teeth were an ugly yellow and blackish color, like they were rotting. There even appeared to be some blood stains on the top row. We all stood terrified, frozen, staring at this abomination, this beast. Then, its eyes snapped onto mine. It made eye contact and twitched. In fear, I let out a gasp, and its eyes immediately perked up as it heard this as if in pleasure. Then, it slowly stood up. Breaking my trance, I then jumped into flight mode. Run! I screamed, making a dash for home. The field, only fifty yards away now. The creature let out an almost metallic, human, bear-like roar. Its scream filled me with fear, and I could sense the hatred in its veins. This monster was primal fear. We ran like crazy as it chased after us, dodging left and right, changing direction, tripping it up so it couldn't catch us. We dove under the barbed wire fence and kept running. I looked back to see it hurdle the fence like it was nothing. Hot on our heels, running on all fours. I tripped over a branch, rolled, catching myself, and kept running. But this put me at the back of the line. I felt its hot breath on me, on my back as it ran. It let out another scream, and I jumped off the nearby cliff to my right. My friends doing the same. It was only a 15-foot drop onto some dead leaves and grass, so we landed somewhat nicely. Except I rolled my ankle in the process, and Aiden landed on his knee on a rock. I looked back, and seen I almost landed on the deer corpse from earlier. That certainly gave me a spark of renewed energy, or adrenaline. The tree line was only 300 yards away, and we ran and ran. We heard it screeching, scrambling down the hill at full speed. We vaulted over rocks and slid under fallen trees, and this thing was right on us the whole time. Teeth bared, roaring in anger. I knew the only goal that this abomination had was to mutilate us, like that deer. We ran and ran, then it roared again, this time sounding almost in defeat, like a lion failing to get a gazelle. We cleared the tree line and ran to the road. We turned back around to see where it was, and it stood in the tree line, just almost out of view, but still visible enough to see it. Evan. It croaked, in a voice so unnatural and evil, almost like demons in the movies, but more metallic and robotic. I didn't even mention this before, but my name is Evan. My friends always call each other mean things so we rarely ever said our real names. Instead of primal fear, this time I felt rage. I puffed out my chest, slammed my hands on my pecs. Come at me, I screamed. A little unsettled by my primal outburst, this thing simply smiled, turned around, and disappeared. We all looked at each other, went back to the house, Aiden's dad didn't hear the screams, so we didn't have to explain anything. We went and hid in his room in silence. None of us really talked about it much except for me. If I was to ask them now about it, they would probably say it was just a bear and that we clearly overreacted. But I'm telling you, there was more to come to prove suspicions. 
At least me. So, this all happened way back in the late 1990s, when I was a college sophomore. Me and the girl I was dating at the time had been going steady for about 8 months, and since she was my real first girlfriend, my mom was pretty keen to meet her, and what better time than the holidays to introduce her to the folks. During the week before Christmas, my mom's family traditionally held quite a large gathering up at my uncle's place over in Sandy, Oregon, my home state. Pretty much all of my extended family headed out there year after year from all over the Portland area. And since they'd gotten word that I was bringing my girlfriend, the hype to meet her was huge. I won't lie, I was kind of nervous that they'd embarrass me in front of her. But that anxiety was totally misplaced. She got on really well with all of them. And despite some playful humiliation when a cousin of mine told her the story of how I literally peed my pants at the Haunted Mansion ride back when I was a kid, they were a credit to me. When it came to driving her back home, she seemed to be more into me than ever. We'd agreed to drive back down to Eugene at like 7pm, so I wouldn't be too tired driving back. But since we had such a good time, we stayed way later than we had ever planned to, and didn't get on the road until like 10.30 that evening. In the hopes of making the journey a little faster, I ended up taking the Oregon 211 instead of just sticking to the I-5 South for the whole drive. Annoyingly, this did not actually make the journey any faster, but point being, the 211 was pretty much surrounded by farms or these huge swaths of dense pine forest as you can imagine, big stretches of it aren't lit very well at all, and for some parts of the drive, we were moving through complete darkness, saved only by our car's headlights. But honestly, I wasn't all that worried about it. I was pretty good at reading a map, and once I was back on the I-5, a road I know pretty well, I figured everything would be all good. So we're just cruising along, in high spirits, talking about how goofy some of my family were, but generally my girlfriend was singing their praises, telling how she could not wait to meet them again. It's right around then that we hit a section of highway that descends down this big old hill, leading up to the bridge crossing over Deep Creek. There, the highway is sandwiched by some very dense forest, the densest you're likely to ever see and there is absolutely nothing lighting up the highway. So the only thing we could see from the front seats of the car is like maybe 20 to 30 feet that our headlights are illuminating and pretty much nothing else. But like I said, we're in high spirits, completely unprepared for what was about to happen. Right as the highway starts to level off, something darts across the front of us so fast and so suddenly that I barely missed smashing into it. I braked so hard that I almost gave the pair of us a whiplash. Then, when we're both stopped, both me and my girlfriend are in a complete frenzy of, oh my, did, did you see that? What was that? There are plenty of deer in that area of Oregon, plenty of coyotes too, but the thing that ran out in front of us was way too big to be a coyote and something about the way it moved gave me this gut feeling that it was not a deer either. The shape was just too slender, almost like whatever was out there had moved on two legs, not four. Now, next thing, and I know how completely dumb this sounds in retrospect, but my curiosity just got the better of me. I decided that I wanted to investigate. So, again... This was also incredibly dumb. I turned the car like 90 degrees on the highway so I could point our headlights into the woods. Yes, this could have caused a horrible accident if another car had come along at the same time I was doing this. But was I thinking straight at the time? Of course not. You see, as a kid growing up in the Pacific Northwest, 
I'd heard a lot of stories about Bigfoot and Sasquatch. I'd be lying if I said they didn't capture my imagination. Now, I'm not saying that I thought I'd caught a glimpse of a Gigantopithecus or anything. I know the stories are mostly exact that. Just stories. But part of me just wanted to be sure. So, like I said, I turned my car 90 degrees, turned on my high beams, and stepped out of the driver's side onto the highway. I stare up into the trees for a minute or two, but I don't see anything. Nothing is moving. The whole scene was as quiet as the grave. But as I'm looking, I just get this feeling in the pit of my stomach and start to feel as if I'd made a huge error of judgment. It was one of the most intensely terrifying feelings that I've ever felt in my life. A feeling like I was being watched by something predatory. I know it's a huge cliche, and the whole I felt like I was being watched thing is such a tired old trope, but I really don't know any other way to phrase it. My heart was pounding, the hairs on the back of my neck are now standing on end, and my guts turned to ice. Without turning my back on the woods, where I expected the danger to come from, I started edging back towards the car. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, I practically jump out of my skin when I hear the car's horn let off one long, excruciatingly loud extended blast. I mean, it scared me so bad that I almost straight up peed my pants. Haunted mansion style. Like when I was a kid. My first thought was that my girlfriend has ended up leaning on the horn as she climbed over into the driver's seat for some reason, maybe to get my attention. She'd done that once or twice before. But as I turned back around, she's still on the passenger side, but that she's actually leaning over to push on the horn in what was evidently a frenzied attempt to get my attention. I run back to the car and ask her if she's okay. She doesn't say a single word to me. She points off to a spot, about 50 feet away from where we were parked in. I spin my head around to see what she's pointing at. That's when I see it. What was, without a shadow of a doubt, the thing that had run in front of our car just a few minutes prior, lit up by the residual light of our high beams, what I saw was really, obviously a man but he was covered in animal fur, what looked like a mishmash of deer skins, bear skins, and elk skins, and on his head, secured in a way I'm not even sure of were these antlers. At the time, because of how close it was to the holidays, I remember the words reindeer man just kind of flashing through my head, maybe in the naive hope that the dude was dressed that way out of some misdirected festive spirit, but he certainly didn't seem in any kind of festive spirit, not in the least bit. Like, I couldn't see his eyes because the weird kind of head covering he had on, but I could see his mouth, and at first, he kind of looked like he was giving us a smile, only as I looked, I could see it wasn't a smile at all. This guy was just baring his teeth at us like the way chimps do, as some kind of warning. After that, he turned and walked off into the forest. Obviously, right after that, me and my girlfriend just got out of there, got back on the road towards the I-5. It took us both a while to calm our nerves, but my girlfriend was particularly shaken up. That's because she'd seen something that I had not. And as we drove on, she explained exactly what that was. While I'd been staring off into the woods, looking for Sasquatch or whatever, she noticed him out of her peripheral vision, but was basically frozen in fear for a moment or two as she watched him slowly walk towards me. Or rather, walking isn't the right word. From how she described it, this guy was stalking, the way a hunter might stalk a deer. The way she put it, she had to summon pretty much all of her courage to be able to lean over and honk the horn the way she did. 
Then, when Reindeer Man had heard the honking, he backed off a little. And before I saw him, like I said, he just kind of froze in place before disappearing. I did a fair amount of online research when I got home to try and find out if anybody else had any run-ins with this guy. But there was absolutely nothing online about him. There are plenty of crazy survivalist types up here in the Pacific Northwest. I'm guessing he was one of those. But they tend to be pretty open about their existence. Sometimes even advertise themselves as militiamen or whatever. Whereas the reindeer man seemed like he was living completely off the grid. I don't live in Oregon anymore. Me and my girlfriend during the encounter broke up at the end of college. But when we were still together, I happened to be driving down towards Eugene. I always avoided the stretch of highway that I saw the reindeer man on. I've told this story a lot over the years, and some people honestly just think I'm making it up, like a campfire tale or something. But it's not a tale. It's not made up. And it's definitely not just intended to be some dumb, spoopy story. It's most definitely a warning to anybody traveling on that road at night. Because if my girlfriend wasn't with me when he ran out in front of the car, if she wasn't there to spot him before he crept up on me, only to scare him off with the blast of the horn, I honestly might not be here to warn you. So please, this holiday season, drive careful, drive slow, and do not stop, for any reason, on dark, deserted stretches of forest highway. Back when I was 16, 17, and even up to 18, my father and I were very close. In fact, we would often, instead of getting hotels or anything like that, we would just camp out on the side of the road. Literally, my dad would pull over, and we would just walk, maybe 200 yards into the woods, pitch a tent, and there we go. We'd done this more times than I could possibly count, so this wasn't scary for any of us. We were pretty well versed in the outdoors, camping in many areas that were uncomfortable to many people, just kind of out there, many times along the highway because of the long road trips we used to make. We often didn't have time to find a hotel, or want to. My dad and I were much more adventurous, and found the thrill of hiking and sleeping in the woods much more exciting. However, we did have one bad experience. We were in Northern California, somewhere north of Sacramento to be exact, but not quite to the Oregon border yet. We had pulled over somewhere along the road, and we decided to camp out probably about a hundred feet or so from the road. I remember that very distinctly, because this time we had camped much closer to the truck. I think it was because my dad wanted to make sure he can get his supplies easier, for whatever reason this time, and the highway was much more audible. So, everything was normal. We fell asleep that night, and as we were getting up the next morning dismantling the tent, my father, who had walked off a bit in the woods to go explore and go relieve himself in the morning, was running back to me, saying we gotta double time it and load the truck up. Somebody is coming after us. I just listened to my dad, because he's never fearful in the woods. So we loaded up the truck. I kept trying to look back, but did not see anything. We loaded up in probably about 10 minutes, which is record time for both of us. We got out of there and back on the road. My dad seemed very unnerved, very panicked, very unlike him in nature. He's always extremely relaxed, very knowledgeable, very secure in this environment. For him to act like this, something was clearly off. I began poking and prodding for answers, and after a few minutes, he opened up. He said he saw about an eight to nine foot tall man, what he described as covered in animal skins, or maybe it was like an upright walking deer. He wasn't too sure, but it looked like a man with large antlers or a headpiece. I remember being so confused, but he said this man's face was all wrong, distorted, and glowing white eyes. 
What was weird with his description is he said that this eight to nine foot tall man was so covered in these animal skins, it was hard to tell if he was really that hairy or just so well disguised in animal skins and said it looks like he had a crude ax in his right hand that he was dragging against the ground. When I try to ask more about the purpose of this man being out there, that maybe somehow we had encroached on his territory, my father dismissed that and said judging by the look in his eyes and his face, he looked partially human, but something else. I never knew what my father meant. Now that I'm much older, and that experience is so far in the past, I almost wonder if he's speaking about a Wendigo, since I know so much about them now. Unfortunately, my father passed away only two years after I turned 18. It was right before my 21st birthday party, actually, and so I'll always wonder what he truly saw in the woods that day. Could it have been a Wendigo? Could it have been a Sasquatch? Or something else entirely? I live near the Ozark Mountains, and there are often lots of strange happenings reported, but I have never experienced something for myself until just a few weeks ago. People go missing all the time, and bodies are found. Strange sightings or sounds are witnessed by hikers, walkers, even kids on trips. I have no explanation whatsoever for what I saw and heard. I've been puzzling it over a few days, and it still makes no sense. I wasn't even out for a walk, or any of the more typical scenarios. I was standing on my back porch, looking at the yard, calling for my cat, actually. It was late evening, and she should have been in by now. It was a real still and quiet evening, and I would have been able to hear her meowing, if she was answering my call, like she usually does. Instead of a meow, though, I heard a very distinctive growl, low and quiet, so if I had not been such a still evening, I likely would have picked up on it. Something about it caused me immediate concern for my cat, not for myself just yet. I called her name again, Buttercup, Still, nothing. But I did get the sense that there was something shifting slowly on the other side of the fence at the back of my yard. At this point, I wasn't afraid. More worried about my cat and that whatever was outside my yard was possibly some sort of predator. I didn't want to scare it off right then, in case it had her. So I crept up to the fence and just listened for a moment. I could for sure hear something behind there, breathing heavily, more like panting and that growl. Because it was late evening and dark, and the fact that I lived near the mountains and not in the middle of a city, there wasn't a ton of light. The moon was giving me some help, but otherwise, the yard was pretty dark. I edged my way along the fence until I got to the gate. Luckily, I'd replaced it fairly recently, so it opened pretty well, without making too much noise. Since there had been no sounds from my cat, Buttercup, I thought that I'd check to see what was out there. Not being a complete schmuck, I grabbed the shovel that was next to the gate, just in case it was a coyote or something. I will try to describe what I saw to you. Bearing in mind it was dark, and my eyes were trying to adjust whilst my brain was trying to make sense of the madness. You see, there was something there by the fence, just as I had heard. It appeared to be on all fours as you would expect an animal to be, but the body looked wrong somehow. It was the way its back was arched, and the head was hanging low despite the fact that I could see through the dark and that it was completely covered in a light-colored hair. It almost looked like a person on their hands and knees, or like when you're a kid and you try to spider walk. It was making that heavy panting 
and low growl noise as I stared at it. I couldn't see the head properly, as it was bent, facing the floor. Again, more like a person than an animal was meant to be in that position. It was just beginning to raise its head, when I heard a meow. Looking behind to see me was Buttercup, pressed up against the fence, looking scared. As I bent down to pick her up, I then took my eyes off the thing behind me, just for a moment or two. Just a moment. But, when I turned back, Buttercup, now safely in my arms, the thing was no longer low on the ground. It stood up on two legs. It was as tall as me, and alongside that very hairy body, I finally got to see its face, albeit very quickly, and as I said, it was dark, but the face, it looked human. It then ran, and when I say ran, it was gone in a flash, and so was I, back into the house with my cat, locking every door and window that I could find. That was about three weeks ago now. Buttercup is now a house cat exclusively. No way I'm letting her back outside. I have no idea what that thing could have been. But I have heard stories of men who can turn into animals. I just never until now ever believed it could even be a remote possibility. My first ever memory is one of two that I look upon as unexplained. It is a short memory. I think I was about four years old. I know this because at the time, we were living somewhere in New Mexico, and I was in my first ever big girl bed, as in no railings and not a crib. We moved to a different state before I even turned five. My mother maintains that the house we lived in at the time was built on Native American burial grounds. I don't know if this is true, and Mom also reports a lot of paranormal happenings during our four years there. I remember very little. The massive sky, just because the land was so flat, and the white stone gate that surrounded our garden. I don't really have any memories before this time. There are things I know, because of pictures or stories, but this is my first ever living, feeling, terrifying memory. I remember waking up from my sleep in the middle of the night to a low growl. At the end of my bed, the red eyes of a large black dog burned in the darkness, glaring at me as it snarled. But the dog was not quite a dog. It's hard to describe, because it was physically a dog. I could also see a man's eyes staring at me, as if wearing the mask or illusion of a dog, if that makes any sense. I am now 29, but the memory has remained vivid. I remember my pink sheets, the dark room, the red eyes, and terror. I don't remember what happened next, and I assumed for a long time that it was just a really bad nightmare I had as a little girl. I never really mentioned it. I didn't really understand it at the time, and my childhood became pretty complicated soon after. However, when I was about 13, I started telling my mother about it, sort of out of the blue on one of the nighttime bike rides we used to do occasionally to go on together, and she immediately became very animated, as she claimed to have seen the exact same thing in that house at the end of her bed, only she did not think it was a man in a dogskin mask, but just a big black dog with glowing red eyes. About ten years pass, while getting high with one of my brothers, we were talking about supernatural stories, and I brought it up again. He asked me to retell the story, and then told me that it sounded a lot like something he had come across while looking up different tribal beliefs in the Americas. Something called a skinwalker. We spent the rest of the night finding out what we could about them. 
but there was surprisingly very little info on there about it, beyond a description, and few stories here and there. My family settled in the UK a while ago, and we just entered a second lockdown. I'm out of a job, so I find myself with a bunch of free time to chase up on things that I've pushed to the back of my mind. I'm pretty skeptical in general. I think it's likely that I had a nightmare. I had a lot of them as a kid, and still do sometimes. Like screaming myself awake nightmares, to my embarrassment. However, what makes me take pause is that my mother saw it too. And beyond that, at four years old in the mid-90s, I doubt I ever heard of anything like what I saw. It just seems a little implausible that I would come up with something so closely matching this thing that has been talked about for hundreds of years and is still talked about today. But, supposing I put my skepticism to one side, three things really bug me. Number one, every other story I have ever read about skinwalkers seem to hinge on the fact that they are not able to get into your home. And the story narrator always seems to think that the very worst will happen if they do. Well, mine was totally in the house, visited two different bedrooms, and just snarled, stared, scared us. Number two, if I'm honest, life for my family got pretty hard after that. We were very unlucky. A devastating death. Horrible sudden illness that was never recovered from. Constant drug and alcohol abuse. Attacks on the family and more. Honestly, it was a really bad spiral down. Sometimes I wonder. And number three. I have read in a couple places that you should never lock eyes with one. As it could take control of your body or be absorbed into you. We definitely locked eyes. There was really nowhere else to lock. Being in front of those eyes made me feel like a deer in front of the headlights. Frozen, staring right back. So, yeah, I have questions. I sort of want to go searching. I sort of want to just forget about it. I sometimes wonder if I'm cursed. My cousins live in some remote, middle-of-nowhere place that could easily feature in a movie, like Deliverance, if it wasn't for the fact that their actual house is kinda nice. Still, their area is handmade for a horror story, and sure enough, they have told me stuff that they've seen and heard, and more recently smelt over the years. The smell part was evidently the worst of the lot they ended up getting some work eyes in, as of course they assumed there was some practical cause for their smell. Backed up sewage, that kind of thing. But no. Despite being in the middle of nowhere, they take good care of their stuff, and there were no issues with pipes or septic tanks. They searched under the house. Maybe a raccoon had died down there, but nothing. It also came and went. The smell wasn't always there, and it didn't seem to have a pattern either. My youngest cousin, Ruby, was still only a kid, around 9 or 10, and she had began getting night terrors and only being able to sleep with my aunt, which was kind of draining too. So, aunt asked if I could come down for a few days and help out, since I was home from college for just a bit. Nothing happened those first three days. No smells, no sounds. No one saw any strange shadows. And Ruby was quite content to sleep with me. Despite a ten-year-old age gap, she'd always been like a little sister to me. Then, on the third night, it happened. Ruby woke in a sudden panic, which woke me too. As I was hugging her to calm her, I noticed the smell. It was worse than a public restroom, where the person before you had the stomach flu, added in with some gone-off egg salad and meat 
that had been left out in the sun, all combined. I was trying to calm Ruby, and to not gag myself, when to add to the whole trauma, I heard a voice calling my name. I remember sitting bolt upright, because I hadn't heard the voice for several years. Do you hear anything? I had asked Ruby, and she nodded. What can you hear? I had asked her, and she replied. I hear Nona, calling my name. You hear Nona's voice, I checked, and she is saying your name, Ruby, right? She nodded, and continued to bury her head in my arms. Again, I too heard Arnona, only I heard my name, Chase. I don't think that there is any way to get Ruby and Chase mixed up. Oh, and Arnona. That very distinctive, gravelly voice was both heard, by us. She has already been dead for three plus years. I ended up doing some googling that night, long after Ruby had safely drifted back to sleep. It was the first time I had ever witnessed anything. I don't believe in ghosts, necessarily. Not in the way that they can randomly appear. Nona wouldn't leave New York. We always had to travel to see her. She had never been to aunts. Plus, aside from not wanting to leave her home, she was the nicest old lady we could have all wished for to have as a grandmother. Caring, generous, and kind. A large chunk of my inheritance from her was paying for my college. So I searched for mimicking dead person's voice, awful smell, strange shadows, and even night terrors. You guys are likely all way ahead of me. House in the middle of nowhere. Very likely to have been Native American territory in the past. All the signs point to a Wendigo. When I was in college, I went camping out in the desert with a close buddy of mine who had horses. We fancied ourselves as some kind of cowboys of the old times. I was a city boy, so it was strange, exciting, and a wee bit scary, especially when he told me about coyotes, how they scream and howl, and can make terrible noises, but they shouldn't come too close to camp, shouldn't being the word which made it scary. Since I never really stepped foot in the outdoors, I knew nothing, very naive. I can distinctly remember lying there and hearing the noise. I was glad he had warned me about it, or I think I would have jumped on the horse and got out of there while I still could. It was disturbing and unsettling enough when I knew what the sounds were. Of course, he had promised me that they wouldn't come close, that we wouldn't hear the howling, snuffling, sniffing, and what sounded like one peeing on the side of the tent. Just stay still, he ordered, when I was literally shaking in fear. They're just being nosy, marking their territory. And I tried. Maybe would have been okay if it wasn't for the horses. They were tethered next to the tent, aside from a few disgruntled whinnies. They hadn't kicked up too much of a fuss. Until now. Now, they started neighing and snorting, and we could hear them struggling and kicking as they were trying to break free. My buddy suddenly produced a gun that I had no idea he'd even brought, and a flashlight, although it was incredibly light out, considering we were miles from any kind of roads or houses. He said he just let off a warning shot to scare them, but first, he wanted me to go to the horses, as they would be spooked by the noise. Before this can happen, though, we saw the coyote. Now, as I've already told you, I'm a city boy through and through. The closest I'd come to any kind of wild animal was the zoo. I remember seeing a deer for the first time, and how amazing that was. I know, please, if you're a country person, try not to laugh. I was scared enough thinking this was a regular wild beast, with teeth and claws, and no sense of right and wrong. If it attacked us, it was bad. If it attacked the horses, it was equally bad, 
as we would have a hell of a trek back. But even me as an amateur, and all things in nature, knew what I was now seeing was in no way natural. The coyote, if you could call it that, to start with was huge. Giant. I'm talking supersized. When it saw us come out of the tent, it reared up on its hind legs, so it was like a coyote-type man standing there. My buddy, being a good old country boy, shot at it right away, spooking the horses. He pumped around four or five shots into that thing, and it just stood there, as if the bullets went straight through it, or it just wasn't being bothered. The horses were now going crazy. My buddy just stood there, looking shocked that this thing wasn't even being affected by the bullets. And then, it just gave an almighty howl, ran off on two legs, but quicker than I have ever seen any sort of man or creature move. After it was gone, we didn't say anything for quite some time. We were successful in calming the horses and going back to the tent. He stayed by the flap with it open, gun close in hand all night. As soon as it was light enough, we packed up, rode home. No questions asked. Once we were back and settled the horses, I asked him what that thing was. What had we seen last night? I had never seen him look so scared. Then, he proceeded to tell me about an old legend that he had heard, since he was just a boy, but never believed it could be true. What he told me was something about a were-coyote. This was apparently a man who had made some sort of pact with black magic practicers, who would grant him the power to shapeshift and change into an animal that he first killed, and then wore the skin of. He didn't need the full moon, or for it to even be nighttime. As long as he wore the skin, he would turn. But as with all the powers over years, the man would become more beast than human, and would spend hours roaming the deserts, hunting, as an animal would, stuck in that constant half-life of part man, part beast. He was certain that that's what we had seen last night. I just don't know. It seems so unbelievable. And yet, I had seen that thing with my own two eyes, witnessed it being shot full of lead, and also, it racing away quicker than the speed of light. Something really terrifying. Something really terrifying happened to me just a few days ago. I really wanted to share it to see if anyone might be able to explain to me what on earth I saw. I usually don't post on here often, so I'm hoping that anybody can answer my question. Anybody with experience in this sort of thing. I was in the woods, walking my dog as usual. Something I do all the time, and have for years. Same woods, same trail... Same walk. Sometimes we see deer there, and my dog could not care less. He never really bothers chasing them. A lazy son of a gun, to be honest. Sometimes, though, the woods can smell kind of funky. I mean, it is a giant toilet for nature, and there are patches of stagnant water around, which, thank God, my dog has no interest in drinking out of. You also find the dead bird, or a creature. But this time, it was like all those things mixed together and amplified by a thousand. To add to the stench, which was actually eye-wateringly bad, the dog began acting more like a wimp than usual, whining, wrapping itself around my legs. I'm not too cruel, but he clearly needed to go and do his business. Otherwise, there would be an unwanted present for me on the way home. So, I tried to shake him off, and get him to at least go, and sniff some trees to go get in the zone. I heard some crunching, coming from right behind us. Like something stepping on the leaves, and twigs on the ground floor. As I said, there's ample wildlife in here. So I wasn't too worried, until I turned around to see what was there. By now, the dog was shaking. He was in between my legs and trembling so much. 
my own body was vibrating. The smell was even worse now too, and I had to put my hand over my nose and breathe through my mouth. Then, I saw what was behind us. It was like a deer, but although I knew instinctively that it was not a deer, I couldn't really think exactly what else it could be. It was much bigger than even a stag, and had the most magnificent yet terrifying antlers. The whole body of the deer looked wrong. Very thin, fragile, gaunt, and starving. Gray in color, and parts of the fur actually looked as if they were hanging off its body. My first thought, because I tried convincing myself that this was normal, and it was indeed a stag, and possibly diseased and sick, which would account for the smell and bits of apparent flesh. However, two very distinct things happened next, which are the reasons I'm telling you my story, and not having reported the creature to any other authority. Number one, this thing proceeded to stand up on two legs, I looked over at my dog. It was clearly looking right at my dog, and I'm actually grateful for that. Number two, this is really messed up. I still don't know for certain this even happened because, well, it sounds so whack, and the only witness was the dog. He can't tell me if I was just hallucinating at this point, but I swear to you, this thing spoke or knew my name. I swear that when it stood up like a person, staring at the dog, it spoke my name. You can bet I hightailed it out of there, dragging my dog with me but only after a few seconds. Something he never does. But only after a few seconds. That dog was dragging me as we raced back to the opening and jumped back in the car. I jumped in. The dog got in the front. Something he never does. Something I never allow. I just needed to get far away from here. Can you help me? I've barely slept since this happened. My poor dog. I don't think I will ever be able to step foot onto that trail or those woods again. How did this thing know my name? How could it talk to start with? I just need some answers. Please, can someone tell me what that thing was? The plain spoken events of my story won't make much sense without a little bit of context. So, please, bear with me. I have been close to my grandmother my entire life. I could tell there was something different about her when I was just a little girl. I just didn't know what it was. As I grew up, I found out it was several things. One of them was that she was a proud woman, and she wore our family's Native American heritage more than everyone else did. The second was that she was not afraid of practicing the magic of our ancestors. She had all kinds of wards and daily rituals that she kept by clockwork, and apparently it worked, because I always remembered her being something of a mystical figure from my childhood, like someone out of a storybook. Do you remember having anyone from your childhood whom you just felt better as soon as you saw them? Everything about them made you feel better, and you felt that at any moment they could lead you off to a world of wonder and beauty. That's how I felt about my grandmother. I would eventually find out that she didn't keep up her practice of magic for the sake of her heritage. But, for the time being, it was enough to see it as just a part of her sticking to her identity. The memory of a child is far from perfect. But I swear, the woman never aged. She looked the same way when I was a toddler as she did the last time I ever saw her before she would pass away a month later. Now, there was someone else in my childhood that was the exact opposite of my grandmother. Someone that when I saw him and heard him, I felt apprehensive, uncomfortable, and tense. I hope none of you can relate to that. That person was my very own uncle. Never had a criminal record to speak of. Neither did he have a bad reputation 
He just had this miasma of badness hanging off of him. He would try to hug me and hold me like any of the other relatives, but it was like magnets with the same charge. When he got close, I was compelled to get away. He had less and less of the effect on me as I grew up, but it never went away. It was quite a puzzle to my maturing mind, because the older we get, the more we're taught to explain things in concrete terms, which I might add is how the death of childhood magic happens. At last, but not least, I swear the man would not stop looking at me. He didn't exactly stare, but he did seem to always look for just a few seconds longer than he ought to, but not long enough for me to get fed up and call him out. So she passed away, and as many members of the family made the trip down to be present for the funeral as possible. Again, she being a proud woman, she never left the res. Much of the accommodations that were within my family's personal price range were either in or near the desert, along desolate highways. We ended up in a single-story hotel, where the only thing you could see outside that suggested civilization was the asphalt. The rest was sand and cacti. My parents could tell that I wasn't exactly taking my grandmother's passing very well, so they spent the extra money and let me have my own room. Some people find the company of others soothing during times of grief. I'm the opposite. And that's when the night came and something happened. It was knocking that was so soft that it could have been mistaken for the sound of some part of the building expanding, but it got louder, gradually increased. There was no way that it was a tree tapping the building. There weren't any trees on the property. It eventually became so loud that there was a definite intention behind it. It was the rhythm that my grandmother used to drum out on the bathroom or bedroom door to make sure if it was okay for her to enter. I wasn't entirely asleep, nor was I fully awake, but I knew it. I knew it was morning. I remembered what I heard, but it was easy to write off as a dream. We went to the funeral service, and it was every bit as dismal and heavy as I expected. We filed by her casket, and she looked like the embalmers hadn't even touched her. The magic she had practiced when she was alive seemed to have a preserving effect on her. Seeing her look like herself was the only bright spot in the entire matter. There was one other thing that stood out as unusual. My uncle, her son, took the liberty of stroking her cheek. And then he did something that happened so quickly, I wasn't sure if I'd actually seen it. When he drew his hand back to himself, there was a slight tick of the wrist, as if he either had an involuntary twitch or he had plucked a single hair from her head. I was sure that I had seen the hair between his fingers, but it was over before I could verify any suspicions. We decided to stay one more night the whole thing was much more exhausting than we ever expected. That following night went the same as the one before. I slept on my own, and that knocking happened again while I was in a twilight state of being awake. It didn't shake me like it did the last time. So, I was about to drop back down into dreamless sleep when I heard my grandmother's voice come from the other side of the door. It wasn't just her voice. She was saying my name. She was asking if she could come inside. By that point, I was now fully awake, and my heart was pounding out the rhythm of the feet of a fleeing rabbit. There was a pause when I was not answering, and then the voice on the other side began to whistle. That's when I knew that I wasn't being visited by my grandmother. That's when I held perfectly still and did everything I could not to breathe. I think most of you can tell where this is going. No, I never found out for sure if it was my uncle or not. 
but that's the working conclusion that I've arrived at. No, I never found out for sure if my uncle was a skinwalker, although he would have been in the environment necessary to discover the lore and the magic behind how to become one. I did find out much later that my own grandmother had been so steeped in Native American magic due to a deeply personal fear of skinwalkers, and I don't remember seeing my grandmother and my uncle in the same room together, ever. There's a story to be heard in there somewhere, for sure, and it's a story that I seem to have been along with for a paragraph or two, but it's a story that I'm not sure I exactly want to hear. I worked in a foster home, and I'm proud to say that it's not the kind of place that generates the horror stories you hear about. It's located in Arizona, and the place's reputation is pristine. They may not be able to magically conjure good parents for some of these kids out of thin air, but as long as the kids are under their jurisdiction, they are very much cared for, and we did everything in our power to make sure they felt loved. The founder built the place with the attitude of what if the child never gets adopted? How do you make them feel okay if nobody wanted them? Simple. You run a good foster home, and you run it the way you would run a good family. Look, I'm not trying to throw a sales pitch. I'm just trying to give you the context of my story. It's my understanding that many of the creatures that appear in the accounts on your show are drawn to negativity, bad things, bad places. It's that much more puzzling to me that I have a story to tell, since, honestly, negativity was not a part of this place's history. Now, I'm not going to tell you that we were in any way perfect. We did have one kidnapping, and since then, the security and supervision protocol had been made tighter. Even in spite of those steps, a child accidentally got left outside when she decided she was going to hide from the staff when it was time to corral everyone inside. If she had not been sobbing so loudly, she may have never been found. I myself was present for that incident, and it's probably an additional factor in me having this story to tell in the first place. We have a playground that's bigger than most, and you will find at any school. It's a testimony to how much our founder wanted the children that spend time with us to be so comfortable. The time it takes to get everyone off the playground and double check that no child is left outside is a long and drawn out process. Tags are issued, heads counted, then everyone goes inside. Heads are counted again, where the main hallway veers off into bedrooms. One afternoon, after the children had come inside from playing and they had all been accounted for, I was sitting in a caretaker's lounge with a cup of coffee just finally catching my breath. It was completely silent, and I thought I had heard through the wall a little voice say, let me in, three separate times. It was said so flat, and in the same way with each repetition, that I thought it was a child's doll or something. But after a while, the voice repeated a second time, saying, please let me in, three times. The phrasing changed each time I heard it, and it was probably the sixth time when I noticed that the only way it could be coming from the other side of the wall is if it was outside. Still skeptical, because all kids had been accounted for, but it was my duty to make sure. I unlocked the outside door, went out and scout around. The playground felt emptier than usual. For some reason, the entire world felt empty. I estimated the spot where the voice would have to be if I was going to hear it in the lounge. But naturally, there was nothing there. There wasn't even a toy. A shiver ran through me before I collected myself and headed back inside. I looked up just in time to see the outside door close and the latch shut. The door's on a spring so that it closes itself when anyone goes through it. 
So, somebody other than me had just gone to the door. I wasn't taking any chances. I got out my walkie and radioed to the other staff. We had set up a system in an emergency where staff runs to designated stations in the hallway at regular checkpoints so that if anyone wants to get any further in or out, they have to get through two staff members and they're always stationed at a point where there's no way around. So, when everyone took their positions, nobody had reported seeing anyone suspicious. Nobody reported seeing anyone at all. I couldn't get past that outside door and closing without me. But there was simply no rational explanation. I reluctantly let it go. The day ended. Everybody was tucked in. And I personally made several rounds around the facility to make sure there was nobody lurking around. Everything was all clear. Only then, I could allow myself to stop holding my breath, sit down in my lounge. It wasn't really mine, but nobody else liked it because it tended to get really cold around that time of year. I was working on getting paperwork done, but I ended up idly looking at clickbait on the internet. Still busy in the back of my head, trying to make sense of what had happened to the front door while I was outside. After a while, I heard the same voice from earlier. It spoke just as mechanically, and it repeated another phrase three separate times. Only this time it was saying, let me out. I froze, not dare moving a muscle, not even daring to breathe. The request came a second time, slightly changed to please let me out, repeated three times. I didn't hesitate to radio out that time. Staff got up, took their positions, and a few came to join me in the lounge. I told them what I had heard, and we went to the front to investigate. There was nobody waiting for us in the front of the doors. One of the staff members absent-mindedly unlocked the front door to take a look around outside. Something, I don't know what, came running up the hallway towards us. It was moving unnaturally fast, and it stood at least as tall as I did. I'm rather tall as far as women go. What got to me the most were the two dimly lit glowing red eyes that I could see in the head shape. The second thing I noticed was the short antlers that seemed to be sprouting from its skull. These observations were made in less than two seconds, because in that very space of time, it had sprinted out the front door. I seemed to be the only one that noticed the thing make its escape. I must have looked like a madwoman when I shouted about not letting the thing outside, and then yelling about chasing it and not letting it get away. The staff members assisting me looked at me like I was crazy. We did a head count on all the sleeping children. Three of them were missing. That ended up being the longest, most frustrating, most fruitless undertaking I had ever experienced in that foster home. All anyone knew about those three kids was that they were in their beds the last time anybody saw them. There was no sign of them ever leaving their beds or their rooms. No sign of anybody ever coming into the rooms. Nothing. No signs of a struggle. No hidden bones or buried bodies. Nothing. They were simply gone. And there was my testimony about a supernatural thing that only I ever saw and heard. Because of that, they were starting to cast a very critical eye on me. This eventually led to me resigning. In the end, they couldn't pin anything on me, which was really saying something because the system is really good at making a villain out of an innocent bystander with circumstantial evidence when they want to badly enough. There wasn't any evidence to work with. So, here I am. These days, I work a job that I'm pretty underqualified for. Despite not having any charges leveled against me, 
nobody will accept me at any foster homes or any caretaking facilities. The stink of that bad situation just seems to follow me wherever I go. My faith in the system is completely shaken. Any system that fails to protect children and then punishes the people that protect them faithfully is long overdue for a change. If anyone out there has experienced something remotely similar, just know that you are not alone. I'd even be willing to talk if you wanted to reach out to me, and we might be able to help each other. Thank you so much, What Lurks Beneath, for being a channel for me to, and others like me, to get our experiences out there in the open to other like-minded individuals who are willing to listen and understand. One of the tourist traps here in Southern California was a hunter who sold animal pelts that he had hunted and prepared himself. Nobody seemed to be questioning the legality of what exactly he was doing. So, I didn't have anything against getting a genuine coyote pelt. A big part of the sale was the authenticity of the man himself. If there was ever a person that could tell you was full-blooded Indian just by looking at him, it was him. The only difference being that with most Native Americans that I've met, they seem to have a serene wisdom in their eyes. This man didn't have that. There was something harsh and hard-edged in his gaze, but I figured that just came with hunting in the deserts of Southern California. At the time, coyotes were marked as being an overpopulation issue. So, not surprisingly, most of what we had for sale were derived from coyotes. I bought one pelt that had been fashioned into a carrying pouch that I could wear on my waist. And since cooler weather was around the corner, I bought a skin hat. I went my way and that was the last I ever expected to see of the guy. His goodbye smile went all the way up to his one good eye. The other one that was whited out with a cataracts registered no emotion. I got on the highway for the long journey back to South Dakota. It was only a matter of time before I would have to pull over to sleep, but I tried to make that moment as far away as possible. I don't know what made me look out of the corner of my eye, but when I did, I saw what appeared to be some sort of dog-like creature running on all fours and doing a great job of keeping pace with my vehicle. I was driving the legal limit on the highway. Its overall bearing suggested that it was a coyote, but the legs were incredibly long, unnaturally long. It almost looked like somebody had taken the legs from a deer and glued them onto a wild dog. I checked my mirrors. I was the only person on the highway. It was a full moon, so there was plenty of light, and I could see that my eyes weren't playing tricks on me. I tried to get my phone out to take a picture, but I felt myself seize up when the creature looked right at me. It had one coppery eye that was perfectly clear, and then it had one that was whited out. It bared its teeth at me in a snarl, but I knew deep down that it was a grin. And, just like a leaf in a hurricane, it was gone. Is it possible? Now, I know this sounds crazy, but is it possible that the man that I bought the pelt from has the power to shapeshift or could have been a skinwalker? I know it might sound far-fetched, but I can't help draw an eerie correlation between the two. What is your opinion? Back in the winter of 2010, so this would have been January, I stayed in a family-owned cabin for the entirety of the winter. This was up in the mountains of Colorado. I won't tell the area because I want to keep it private, but I can tell you that you get a lot of snow on average, so it's kind of more of a matter of survival sometimes. I prepared beforehand and packed as much supplies as I could, just to see if I could last all winter long, which I managed to, living off the bare necessities, and while not starving, surviving, 
just to see if I could put myself through it and survive. I am no stranger to survival challenges, and this is just one of many that I've done. But I'm not writing to you to boast about my survival skills or my adventures, because during this time, January into early March, something much more grand took place around the cabin that I was at, which, by the way, is very desolate and very remote. There's nobody around, not a soul for miles and miles. It's even quite a trek to get up here, and as soon as snow comes, well, consider yourself lucky if you can make it. A snowmobile was pretty much all I had to get around, and that was when weather permitted. Before doing this challenge, my family regularly keeps up on the cabin, interior, exterior, roofing, and there's always ample amount of wood to use for a fire, so I never had to go out and split my own. Thank goodness. But the woodshed, which held tons and tons of wood, I don't even know how many cords, but more than I could count, was housed just about 100 feet away from the cabin, which meant I daily had to make trips to and from just to keep the cabin warm, and I did all my cooking on the wood stove, which required heat and required wood. It was sometime early January, and I want to say it was evening time. I can tell you it was already dark, so who really knows, because the sun sets at about 4.30ish. I was cooking a stew, I believe, when I began to hear horrible screaming coming from outside. I ran to the window and looked. I couldn't see anything, even though it was lightly snowing. It sounded like bestial screams hollering back and forth. It was bizarre. Imagine hearing the sounds of two dinosaurs fighting, or giants fighting. It sounded absolutely vicious. I have no other words to describe it. The noises went on for quite some time, maybe about 10 to 20 minutes, on and off. I never saw what made the noise, but it sounded like an absolute war zone. Screams, cries, bangs, like something hard hitting a tree. I began to wonder if I was going crazy, or I was genuinely hearing two Tyrannosaurus rexes duking it out in the middle of the Colorado mountains. Well, it eventually stopped, and I can't quite remember if it was the following morning or the morning after the following day, where I went out to go get some wood for the fire, and standing not too far on the hillside was a tall human-like shape that looked very scrawny and unkempt from the waist down, but had huge overly sized shoulders and large antlers, kind of like caribou do. But because of the distance and where the sun was positioned in the sky, it appeared to be mainly a silhouette. It made me stop in my tracks, and I thought somebody, maybe an indigenous native or somebody was out here, covered in animal skins. But it didn't look right. It didn't look exactly human and it was way taller than that of a person. After studying this figure for a moment, I dismissed it, went and grabbed a nice bundle of wood, and as I'm walking back to the cabin, just glanced over my shoulder out of curiosity to see if this figure was still there, or perhaps had moved closer, when in reality, the figure was now gone. Where the figure was standing, even though it was on a hillside, there's no way it could have moved that fast to be completely concealed against the white backdrop of the snowy mountains. I didn't think much of this. It was a little startling. But maybe I was just starting to become stir-crazy. My eyes were just playing tricks on me, I assumed. The day went on as normal, and for the next few days, I began to feel a growing sensation that I wasn't alone that there were others around me. Maybe people. Maybe something more. I couldn't describe it. Then, that feeling began to turn into worry, and finally into danger, in just a matter of three to four days, as I felt whatever this energy or force was, was closing in on me. But yet, after looking around, looking out the windows constantly, in fear that something or multiple things were coming after me. There was nothing, nothing but the beautiful backdrop of snow and the clear, crystal clear air of the mountains. 
I'd be lying if I said I didn't have bouts of insanity, or at least where I think I was insane. Maybe this was my shining moment, like the movie, where the dad begins to just lose it. Maybe there was something about this cabin. Those fears and thoughts were quickly put to rest by what happened shortly after this. Directly down south from the cabin, down the hillside, is a large aspen tree, separated from the others. I took a step out one afternoon, just to catch some breath air, thinking I was literally going insane, when my eyes caught something that didn't quite make sense. It was a head, peering out from behind the tree, trying to remain concealed, but clearly visible from my standpoint. I don't think whoever or whatever this was realized I could see it because it stood out like a sore thumb. It's what I saw that didn't make sense. The head that was looking at me wasn't that of a person like you're probably expecting it to be, and it did not have antlers. It was the black head of a very large canine, except it was higher up from the ground than I can stand meaning that the possibility of this or person being bipedal, which is why at first I assumed it was a person, was all the now real. I couldn't see any eyes or any discernible features, just the shape of a large dog. Maybe a Doberman Pinscher, as far as shape relating to the silhouette. But whatever, or whoever it was, was very visibly watching me from behind this large aspen tree, maybe about 150 yards downhill. It kind of creeped me out. Now, I knew I wasn't crazy. I had to think of what I can do. I went back inside the cabin, kept the door locked, and now I had to be much more methodical about when I got wood and how I got wood. Was I even safe? I always kept a machete on me, just in case. Not necessarily to fight off bears or anything, but it's always good to have when you go into the wild. Even though I would be staying at a cabin for the majority of the winter, it was this moment, right after I came inside, that I realized my insanity wasn't necessarily my insanity, that there really was something afoot. Now, after seeing the gaunt figure with huge caribou antlers and this large Doberman Pinscher dog head not far off down the hill, what was happening? I contemplated this the rest of the night, and it very much disturbed me. And it was that night, I do remember, that I was awoken by something very large walking through the snow around the cabin, tapping ever so lightly against the wood, like it had nails, and it was just slowly dragging them. And sometimes I would hear grunts and snorts and sniffing, keeping me awake the entire night because I'm a fairly light sleeper, and this just didn't allow me to fall into a deep REM sleep like I needed. So every time I would hear the slightest noise, I would hear this thing walking around all night long. I think this night was when I began to feel the pinnacle of my emotions, that I was truly in danger, and I was indeed being stalked by some horrendous crazy mountain predator that I didn't even know existed. I couldn't ignore this anymore, this wasn't just somebody hunting me in a costume, or some crazy lunatic you'd expect to see in a movie with an axe. This was far beyond anything of my comprehension, and unfortunately, my story gets worse. The next morning, I remained pretty paranoid after the events of last night and the previous day. I wasn't exactly sure what to do, but I had to get wood and maintain heat to cook and survive if I didn't want to die of cold. I kept my machete on me at all times, constantly glancing over my shoulder, looking around me, acting like a paranoid schizophrenic. I wasn't exactly sure what this next day would bring, but fortunately, at least until about 3 p.m. in the afternoon, nothing. The other creepy thing is, when I tried to scout around the cabin to see where this large shape or thing was walking around the night before, sniffing and grunting, right where I heard it tapping against the walls. There was no point in looking for any tracks, because it had continuously snowed throughout the night, 
covering any evidence that there would ever be anything. Same thing with looking for tracks leading up to the cabin. The snow was fresh, and anything that would have remained was now buried and hidden. Fast forward to about 3 p.m. of that day, and while I hadn't had anything else happen since, this is where things began to get even more creepy. I started hearing my name being called from outside. Far away, I couldn't even begin to tell you the direction that I heard my name being called from. It sounded like it was coming from all around the cabin, and not just one direction, like a chorus of voices. And here's the eerie part. I was able to recognize each and every voice. Every single voice was the voice of dead relatives. My great-grandfather and great-grandmother, my great-uncle, and other relatives that have since long passed. I'm not exactly sure what was going on. Was I having a mental breakdown? Was being up here too much for my mind to handle? Was the isolation breaking my mind? Was I having severe altitude sickness? No, I was fine up until I came here, up until the past few days, when all this began to happen. After the voices went on for probably 10 minutes, over and over, calling my name, telling me to follow, I stepped outside to see if I can pinpoint the direction from where this was coming from, when I saw the same original figure I did, on a different hillside, in about roughly the same distance as before also just appearing as a dark silhouette with no discernible real features. A skinny gaunt figure that looked to be covered in animal skins with very abnormally large shoulders and a large head that appeared to be kind of like a caribou. I don't know if the head was like that, but the antlers were like that, where they're so oversized and huge, you can't even imagine how the head can keep those up. Now, I was going from psychotic, to freaked out and paranoid, to terrified, scared, and gripping the machete that I kept at my side even tighter than I ever had before. Running back inside, I now deemed it not safe at all to be outside, period. And the only reason I should ever step foot out is to only ever get wood, and that was it. I made sure to close every curtain in the cabin, which there was only a few windows, so that wasn't a problem. Make sure both doors were locked, and stay low, hunker down, read, keep my mind as distracted as possible. But the noises, the voices, the haunting only ever persisted, worse than it ever has. As the evening progressed into nighttime, now I was hearing all sorts of disturbing noises, the sounds that had accompanied my cabin a few nights prior. The thing walking around, sniffing, grunting, like it was looking for a weak point to get in. Not to mention, the ominous feelings, the voices of my dead relatives calling me, trying to lure me out of the cabin. And just as soon as it started, it all stopped, suddenly, sometime in the middle of the night. I had no idea why, or why the feelings and all the noises around me just suddenly went quiet. Then, maybe not even a moment later, noises began erupting off in the distance. That sound, like two Tyrannosaurus Rexes duking it out, was happening again. Only this time, it didn't sound like two giant reptiles fighting like it had before but that could have possibly just been because of the distortion of the distance and the ambiance of the environment around me. This sounded like beasts and demons fighting for their only meal. It was completely vicious in every sense of the word. I didn't even want to see what was happening, let alone hear it. It was just too frightening. It stopped after about an hour of ongoing racket, and then that was it. The rest of the night was dead silent. Nothing. You could barely even hear the breeze. I was too scared to even step outside to see if there had been anything that would cause the noise. Well, to be honest with you, I ended up cutting the trip shorter than expected. And instead of staying there all winter, 
like I would have hoped to. I decided it wasn't safe to be up here anymore. After this going on for maybe five or six days in total, I needed to leave and abandon my journey. The following day, as I'm getting all my supplies ready to hop on the snowmobile and make it down to semi-civilization, things reappeared for a final time. As I'm getting everything ready, I look up and I see that same gaunt figure with the caribou horns not far in the distance, on the same hillside as I originally saw it. Only this time, it was moving toward me, not moving its legs as if it were walking through snow, but as if it were gliding through the snow, as if there was no resistance and nothing to hold it back from getting to me. Now I was terrified. I got ready as quickly as I could, which I only had a few bags to put on. Once I started it and I began moving at a fast speed, you're probably not going to believe this, but as I turned back, I saw at least three or four of these giant black Doberman Pinscher looking wolves come out of nowhere or from behind the trees, wherever they were concealed at, and jump and leap right toward this gaunt figure. I turned back to where I was going and didn't want to watch what was about to ensue. The noises erupted again of the same sounds that I had heard the night prior. The eruption of violence, like wild beasts fighting in the night. That's what I must have heard. Two of these creatures or demons, whatever they were, they were fighting. I just remember thinking to myself on the way back down, I'm never coming back. This entire mountain, this entire place is cursed. With what? I don't know, but I never want to show up back here again. After speaking to my family, shortly after this stint, I pulled a few family members aside and spoke to them in private about what exactly I encountered going up there, thinking it was just some crazy hallucinations of being isolated. But in reality, I told them that my fears became nightmares as what I saw manifested into actual things that were the cause of my fears. They could do nothing but look down, remain quiet, while some of them told me they knew well that these things were up there, and that's part of the reason why they never went out there themselves. For whatever reason keeping it from me, as if I would mock them, ridicule them, or for whatever reason I'm not sure. But I can thoroughly say that hands down, my little stint of survival up there in that cabin was easily the scariest moments of my life that I've ever experienced. 